The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Should we get started? Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Welcome um, wherever you are. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, all around the world. We have 900 participants signed up for this session. Um, many of you have already joined, so I will make some introductory remarks while people are still coming on. Um, so again, welcome to everyone. My name is Suzanne Moser, and I am just honored and delighted to be the host for this session today on the Ocean Decade, how we co-design the science that we need for that particular decade of research and engaged research. Um, I have not been involved in setting up the decade, uh, but I have been involved with the International Science Council as a senior advisor to its Transformations to Sustainability program. Um, I've served on Future Earths and uh, myself do quite a bit of coastal adaptation research, so I'm just delighted to see this decade come into being and to be part of this particular session. Um, let me give you a very broad overview of what we want to do today. If you want to go to the next slide, I just want to give you a brief um, overview of today's agenda. Um, you see it is packed full with um, the most appropriate speakers for introducing what this decade is about and how we do co-design transdisciplinary solution-oriented research. Um, so we will, you know, hear a little bit about the decade first, introduce that, and then focus on what does co-design solution-oriented research mean, um, and and really how that looks in structure, in 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 practice, what we need to essentially make it happen. Um, we're going to learn from a lot of experience that already exists, um, and and to learn from that and inform us going forward. Um, so let me just open by a few remarks about the decade. Um, the ocean decade has the ambition to trigger a revolution in ocean science that will take us from the ocean we have to the ocean we want. To meet this ambition, the decade will provide a framework for collaborative and participative research um, to advance better integration of diverse knowledge systems from different disciplines, sectors, and stakeholder communities. So truly moving to um, practice relevant, policy relevant, engaged research. Um, as you know, this is just the first of, uh, of a series of sessions on the Ocean Decade. Um, and can I just ask those of you who are um, who will be speakers later to maybe put yourself on mute just to reduce all background noise while I do the introduction? That would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, there will be other sessions in this series, um, and um, the you know that will essentially help with the peer review of the draft implementation plan for the Ocean Decade. Um, and 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 you know really build on what we've learned from that um, because it has revealed a strong demand for discussion and guidance, including uh, in terms of you know what kind of capacity building do we need to do this kind of research going forward? How do we achieve this innovative and transformative ocean science um, that is both relevant to existing and emerging societal needs and responsive across the entire value chain, if you will, from knowledge generation to application and services um, that also reaches across disciplines and actively seeks collaboration between the natural social sciences and even the humanities. Um, and then, you know, work that is co-designed, co-produced, co-delivered through innovative and sustainable partnerships. Um, in the global north, in the global south, with least developed countries, small island developing states, and so on and so forth. This first session today, um, as you know, is entitled Co-Designing the Science We Need for the Ocean Decade. It's convened by the Intergovernmental Oceanic Commission, or IOC, we will use that term a bunch of times today, uh, which is a commission of UNESCO, the coordinating agency for the decade, in partnership with the International Science Council, ISC. We will also use that acronym. <laughs> um, and so we will hear from 
both of the those organizations uh, this morning to essentially introduce or this afternoon to introduce this session for us. Um, our goal today is to explore what opportunities and challenges exist in delivering this co-designed solution oriented research that will lead us to a transformative decade on, on in actions and in knowledge production. The first global session will be followed by a series of regional sessions in October 2020 um, that will facilitate this discussion of regional priorities and needs for co-designed ocean science. They will particularly focus on the capacity development needs. Um, and then there will be a final session in November um, where we will present and discuss the outcomes of these regional events um, and the first session to identify best practices and to inform a proposed approach for conducting co-designed solutions oriented ocean research. A couple of housekeeping things um, for those of you who are listening in today. Thank you again for being here. Um, first of all, I, what I want to say is, um, you know, first of all, make sure I want to make sure that you know that we're recording this session. So, you know, your your comments, your uh, in contribution uh, contributions will be on record, and we will post the recording and any notes and. Uh, additional information from the session on the Ocean Decade website for this. Um, the session is orga organized around after this introductory uh, session that we're in right now to really focus on these two substantive segments I just introduced this what is co-designed solution oriented research and how do we foster it? How do we overcome the typical barriers to doing this kind of work? Um, each one involves some presentation or discussion from some of the presenters that you see on this slide and also involves a Q&A period. Um, and I invite you as we move along that you enter your questions into the question um, segment of this webinar platform. And we will basically get to as many of these questions as we can moving forward through this, you know, through the each of the segments. Any questions we don't get to, we will try to send to our panelists so that they can respond to them and we will post those responses again also on the website. So um, it's just the best that we can do. So let me begin then by inviting Vladimir Ryabinin um, from UNESCO um, to introduce the Ocean Decade virtual series properly. Um, and um, you know, just to give us a sense uh, of of you know what is this all about? What we're, what are we here for? Um, Vladimir is the executive secretary of the Intergovernmental Oceanic Commission of UNESCO, um, as we said, the or coordinating agency for the Ocean Decade. So, Vladimir, the floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you very much, Susanna. Uh, uh, you know, just uh, would like to state that uh, this is Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, and oceanography is the science of of, of the ocean. So uh, I would like to welcome, uh, I, would, I see now 346 participants, and this is not the limit. And it's, it's great that you all are there. Um, so where we are, so the decade is going to be the largest campaign in the history of ocean sciences. And this is not just the science based on curiosity, it's science to help us live better. Science for sustainable development. The implementation plan, uh, of the decade is already with the United Nations General Assembly, and we hope very much that uh, delegations will take note of the plan, and then there will be no further barriers to start the decade. It's important to realize that today, uh, 98 days uh, remain until the start uh, of the decade. So what is the plan? The plan has uh, uh, outlined outcomes of the decade, the qualities of the people in the ocean uh, that would like to achieve. It also identifies challenges. This is the science areas where we need to move forward, like capacity development, like observations and many others. And we probably, and we have to read the plan and also outlines coordination mechanisms. And I see will hopefully will be the coordinating uh, agency of United Nations for the decade. But you know, the design of the decade is to put meat on bones. We have already the bones, the creaton. Now we have to put meat on bones, and this is um, this will be the the scientific uh, content of the decade. 
And the purpose of this uh, webinar series that we're starting today is indeed to start uh, and help you to, to co-design uh, transformative solutions uh, that will be contributing to, uh, to fulfill, fulfillment of ocean decade outcomes. So this is the first session and there will be many more sessions. Um, I think uh, very soon uh, I'm going to show to you uh, what, what is going to happen and uh, we would like to say that um, there must be se several principles uh, principles adopted. So these principles will help uh, many people to contribute to the decay. So uh, fundamental pillars would be uh, related to uh, to uh, to blue economy, to how we deal with data, how we can help small island developing states, how we address gender balance. And now on, on this slide, I would like to introduce to you. Uh, several concepts that I think are very important uh, or pillars uh, for, for this uh, webinar series and also for the co-design of the decade. The first is the concept of inclusivity. So this is the principle of leaving no one behind, ensuring that all stakeholders have the capacity to develop, use and access science-based solutions. Um, specific attention in this particular case will be paid uh, to indeed capacity development to ocean literacy, which is a way of uh, bridging uh, people in the oceans, making them closer, uh, the gender balance, also the engagement of early career ocean professionals, we call them ECOPS, and, and providing, very importantly, equitable access to data, technology, and information. Then there is a principle of co-design and co-delivery. So, and this is the topic of today's presentation. So uh, this looks at the, how Decade will work at the science policy and science solution interfaces. I would add to this uh, also such uh, domains like culture, ethics, and even economy and national accounting dimensions, the private sector interest, private sector participation. So how we engage, because modern leadership is, is in partnership. So uh, now we, we will learn how to better engage everyone and work in the principle of code design then also there is a principle of subsidiarity you know it's not just the control and command and control it's it's, it's in the good sense of this world uh, we would like to ensure that what is happening uh, in the global decade framework can be translated in coherent regional and national actions and priorities so we will be designing a system that really can work so like you design, uh, for example, uh, a car. So the car has to really uh, translate everything into something that can move together. And finally, the principle of partnership. So the partnership should be across disciplines, sectors, communities, and stakeholders. And we are going to discuss this today. So uh, I'd like to say that uh, around 15th of October, IUC will uh, issue the first call of for actions of the decade. Uh, and, and uh, I encourage you to look at these details uh, of, of the call and these sessions will be helping you to prepare to answer the call. So um, encouraging co-design solutions and uh, uh, that would be uh, focused on, on uh, really directed uh, um, research is critical to, 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 to decay. So in this particular case, I would like to salute our dear partners, International Science Council. We recently signed an MOU, and you know, uh, signing MOU is one thing, but we are already working together. And Susan from International Science Council is looking at me. So we start to work, uh, started to work together. So I would like also to thank IUC team for uh, for designing these webinars, uh, particularly uh, Marie Len, who is running now the show, uh, Marie Len Bonvan. And let me let us have a good session. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Vladimir. This is a great introduction. And in the interest of time, I just want to turn it right over to uh, Mathieu Denis, who is the Senior Director of the International Science Council. Um, and Mathieu, talk a little bit about the collaboration um, with the IOC. Thank you very much, Duzi. And many thanks to all of you, colleagues around the world, for joining this webinar at whatever time of day it is where you are sitting right now. Um, first of all, on behalf of the International Science Council, let me just say that we're very proud to collaborate with the Intergovernmental Oceanographic um, Commission in the development and implementation of the Ocean Decade. It is very exciting after so much preparation to now be on the point of launching a decade and, and launching what will have to be a transformative agenda 
for ocean science in the, the years to come. Let me perhaps reiterate some of the points that you, Susie, and you, Vladimir, have already made, but which I think um, are important. We all know by now that so the solutions we need for ocean health, and that applies equally to other sustainability challenges as well, cannot be found within single disciplines. We need interdisciplinary approaches, drawing on the strengths of, of all scientific domains, including the social and the human sciences. But good collaboration between scientists from different areas of expertise, interdisciplinarity, is not enough. For science to be able to contribute long-lasting solutions for healthy and sustainable oceans, we also need science to engage directly with relevant sectors of society outside the professional research community, and to do that in different geographical and cultural contexts. Now, this type of research that is, that is co-produced with representatives from you know, the policy community, from civil society and the private sector is what is being discussed today. It is a different way of doing research. It is a challenging way of doing research, but it is a promising and a necessary type of research, which we urgently need alongside you know, more standard approaches. Luckily, there are communities of practice uh, within and without the ocean science community, which are keen to share their experience in doing that kind of work, transdisciplinary research. And I'm very glad actually to see some of those communities on the program um, of this webinar. The International Science Council is, as some of you will know, uh, an international organization with a vast global membership of well over 200 institutions, including international unions and associations representing natural and social science disciplines, as well as national and regional organizations such as academies and, and research councils. And through its members and its programs, obviously, some of which are co-sponsored with the um, Oceanography Commission, the International Science Council intends to promote and contribute actively to the ocean decade. Now, today's event is one such activity, but there will be series of similar discussions um, of, and debates via blogs, interviews, podcasts, etc. But critically, we will be working with members and partners to foster exactly the kind of transdisciplinary ocean science initiatives that is being discussed today. And we are aiming to do that with all of you and all of the institutions that are representing and participating today. So I invite you all to visit um, our website to learn more about the different initiatives that the ISC um, is doing in the context of the decade. But in the meantime, I also wish you a very fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. And back to you, Susie. And thank you, Denise. Uh, Mathieu, this is wonderful um, as an introduction. I just would love to now turn to Krista von Hillebrand Adrade, um, who is the uh, manager of the US National Weather Service Caribbean Tsunami Warning Program and a member of the executive planning group of the decade. Um, Krista, tell us the vision of what this decade is supposed to do. OK, first of all, good, good day to everybody from Mayagüez, Puerto Rico. And I really want to thank you for the opportunity to share a few words as a member of the executive planning group of the UN decade. To all the, the participants and speakers, thanks for taking the time to attend this event and become part of the ocean science revolution. To the IOC and ISC, thank you for bringing us all together. When the EPG first gathered together in Paris in December 2018, which seems like light years and lifestyles away to discuss the decade and implementation plan, we quickly agreed and acknowledged that while there still remains gaps in ocean science, understanding and data, the current state of knowledge should have been enough to prevent the accelerated decline in ocean health, productivity and safety. If we wanted to obtain different results, we were going to have to try different approaches because paraphrasing Albert Einstein, we were not going to be able to expect different results if we kept doing the same things 
over and over again. It would just be insane. Therefore, central to the Ocean Decade Implementation Plan is the notion of transformation. Action needs to be taken to get from where we are, which is the ocean we have, to where we want to be, which is the ocean we want. As mentioned earlier, our current state of science is largely competent um, for problem diagnostic. But to get to the ocean we want, science needs to also provide solutions and motivate and inspire actions. Our current observing system for climate and emerging service, uh, service data service it needs to be transformed to an ocean data system for understanding the past and documenting the present and predicting the future. Major knowledge gaps, weak ocean literacy among stakeholders, decision makers, and society at large have gotten us to where we are today and where we do not want to be in the future. An ocean literate society making well-informed decisions will make us, will take us to where we want to be. Funding was a big discussion, and we noted that currently most of our science is funded in research mode. And so a clear value chain can lead us to resourcing and commitments for the ocean science research we want. The EPG recognized and documented and emphasized um, the recognition that there's a hugely, huge uneven capacity, especially in developing countries and small island developing states. We need capacity development and transfer of technology based on existing skills and knowledge. As Vladimir said, no one should be left behind and we all should be empowered to get where we would like to be. The next slide. So there is a consensus that if the advances of ocean science are going to support sustainable development, the use and uptake of scientific data and knowledge by the end users, once again, including but not limited to local, national, regional, and global policymakers and decision makers, NGOs, industry, private sector, and communities at large, require a transformational approach. So during the decade, both in terms of action and outcomes, we need to move beyond business as usual to a true revolution in ocean science. The transformative nature of the ocean decade promotes and looks to facilitate an ocean science that uses the 2030 sustainable development agenda and not just SDG 14 ocean focused, as a central framework to identify and address the most pressing societal questions. And we need an ocean science that spans across disciplines and actively integrates natural and social science. An ocean science that embraces local and indigenous knowledge as key knowledge system. We need a science that communicates in forms that is widely understood across society and triggers behavioral change. We have to have science that is shared openly and is available for reuse. Ocean strives for generational, especially the early career ocean professionals, gender and geographic diversity and inclusion in all its manifestations. And last but not least, on this incomplete list, is the science that is co-designed and co-delivered in a multi-stakeholder environment to be relevant and responsible across the entire value chain. For many of us, the terms of concept of co-design and co-construction, co-production, co-delivery may be new. Therefore, it is only logical that our regional and thematic decade workshops would follow up with a series of global and regional virtual series on co-design. I'm truly looking forward to the learning from experts and seasoned practitioners on the best approach to deliver this co-design solution-oriented research. Given the devastating impact of COVID-19 on lives and livelihoods across the globe, this transformation of the way we view and conduct ocean science is all the more relative, relevant and imperative. I hope that you are as ready as I to learn and implement with passion the concepts and tools we need for the ocean science revolution. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Krista, for that invitation to the to the revolution. Um, it makes me just really appreciate um, the program that ISC has been leading for now nearly a decade, which is on societal transformations to to sustainability. So there's lots to learn there. Um, thank you. In in transition to our next segment, um, which you have so nicely set up, which is you know what is co-design solution oriented research. I want to actually start with engaging you all. Um, as you can see, probably on your own web, um, go to webinar panel, we have now 413 participants on this. And um, listening for two hours will be excruciating. So we have to put in a few interactive um, moments here into this webinar. Um, so if you can bring up uh, the poll, um, Isabel, that would be wonderful. We have two questions for you um, that I invite you to respond to um, on your um, whatever, if you're on the computer or on your um, on your smartphones, you might have to turn it around to see it fully, um, see the speakers and, and the uh, presentation. But here, the first question is whether you've ever been involved in something that we call transdisciplinary research um, project, maybe co-design project, or engaged science, or participatory science. So um, if you want to just vote on that. Um, and Isabel, let me know, you know, if we're reaching, when, when we're reaching maybe 80% or more um, of voting, then please move us to the next one. So if all of you could just do this as quickly as possible so we can move on, that would be wonderful. You might have been involved in all kinds of roles. So um, not just as a researcher, but maybe as a funder, maybe as a sponsor, as a participant, as a um, as a stakeholder in whatever role. And there's a second question that actually gets at what role you might have been in. So if we maybe just move to that one. Um, Oops, can you move us to the next question? What role you might have played? So if you can click on whatever makes sense, just, you know, you probably held just one particular role in that typically, but um, let us know. And then we'll look at the results just to see where we all are, the whole 400 of us. I'll just give you another minute here. It'll give good information to the speakers who are coming next. So Isabel, whenever you're ready to show us the results, let's move it. Let's move us to the next segment. Or to the to the results. Can you show us the results? Yep, here we are. So Many of you know what we're talking about. That's important information. <laughs> Great, 70% um, and more. And then what about the next, in terms of the roles that you have played? It's coming right up. All right, most of you are in the researcher role, project managers, some stakeholders, um, a few funders. So um, this, is, this is a great mix and, um, you know, among those who have signed up, the nearly 900 people who have signed up, um, all those roles are represented. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and let's move right into this next segment here, which is really all about looking at what are the key elements, parameters of doing transdisciplinary research? What have we learned from different projects? Um, how do we move from, you know, what many of us have done before, multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity to true transdisciplinarity? Um, so we will focus on that. And to um, begin with that, I want to invite uh, Kartaj Smith, who is the OECD Global Science for with the uh, OECD Global Science Forum to present on key findings of an OECD report that was released in June. Uh, and it was entitled Addressing Societal Challenges Using Transdisciplinary Research. 
Kartaj, tell us what this is all about and how we do it. Okay, great. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to, to be here um, to, to contribute what I can to this. Um, it's also a bit scary. I now know that more than 70% of you have actually been researchers in transdisciplinary projects, so you probably know more about this than I do. Um, so, um, the OECD Global Science Forum is a forum that brings together people from science ministries. And what's interesting is they asked us to do this project looking at how we can address societal challenges using research and in particular transdisciplinary research. Um, and so that is what this report is about. And I will just quickly summarize some of the, the key things in the report. And then you, you can look at the report yourselves. Hopefully, I'll have sold it well enough to you. Um, so in terms of transdisciplinary research, what are we talking about? For this work, we came up with a fairly simple working definition that transdisciplinary research involves more than one discipline and natural and social sciences. And it also involves non-academic stakeholders who may be listed there, public officials, people from industry, et cetera. But you must have both for it to qualify as transdisciplinary. That was the working definition we used. As has been discussed, transdisciplinary research is relevant to all the SDGs. These are the sort of issues where transdisciplinary research might be necessary. We're not saying it's necessary that all research should be transformed into transdisciplinary. The, the traditional trans, inter, uh, disciplinary and interdisciplinary research still has an important role to play. But when you're confronted with the sort of issues that are put up here, these complex societal issues where values might come in, where you need to really develop and test solutions with societal stakeholders, that's when you may need a transdisciplinary approach. Next slide, please. So what do we mean by transdisciplinary? Just to go in in a little bit more depth, it's really about bringing together the realms of research and science and the realm of practice. Um, it's co-designing in terms of bringing knowledge and perspectives from both of those realms together and from different disciplines. And it's co-production in terms of actually doing the research jointly with different disciplines and different stakeholders. In terms of outcomes, you get both scientific outcomes, you get new scientific knowledge, science publications, the traditional science outcomes, but also hopefully you get solutions. You get um, real outcomes that are directly relevant and useful for society. Next slide, please. Um, we've already heard uh, co-creation, we've heard co-production, we, we've heard um, transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary. Um, one of the challenges we had for a policy audience is that actually these terms are used very interchangeably. Um, so people continually talk about interdisciplinary, even though you're saying to them, no, no, we're talking about transdisciplinary. In some countries, for example, in the UK, transdisciplinary is rarely used by most of the community. They talk about uh, co-creation. In fact, the way we look at it, and I think it might be helpful here, is that transdisciplinary research, if you like, is, is the, the extreme of bringing together different disciplines, natural and social sciences, and different stakeholders. But around that, you have related terms where you may just be one discipline interacting with stakeholders, or you may have um, different disciplines interacting, but less with stakeholders. Citizen science, depending on how you define it, part of that is transdisciplinary. All these different terms, I think, are related. And in terms of um, what you're talking about for the ocean decade, I think you need all of these. It's basically moving beyond research that is done just in disciplines and engaging other stakeholders in that process. Next slide, please. In terms of the variation between different transdisciplinary projects, the, there's, there's basically five factors that we identified where, where projects can vary a lot. And this goes back to the previous slide. So the extent to which you're really involving different disciplines, how many disciplines, 
the depth to which you're involving them. Likewise, for non-academic stakeholders, how many are you involving, the extent to which you're involving them. And then this issue of timing, do you involve stakeholders all the way through your research or do you involve them at the start and the end or do you have cycles of involvement? All these are variable and basically no two interdisciplinary projects are the same, but there are, uh, and this is important, there are, there are guidelines, there are experiences, practices out there for all these different um, types of project and it's important to build on what is there. Next slide please. These are case studies we looked at. It, uh, I don't expect you to read all of these but you get a sense of the variety of different areas that transdisciplinary research can be applied to. So, so this range is from community policing through to the sustainable fish industry which is perhaps here the uh, more directly relevant and of course a lot of climate, uh, environment related, sustainable development related areas, but not just. Next slide, please. So skipping forward to the recommendations, what we tried to do was, was look at the system. So work up from looking at projects, what are the challenges for them in trying to implement transdisciplinary research? And what are the implications for the science system? Um, so those the science system includes different actors, so starting with governments, so there were several recommendations here. For example, uh, governments have a goal in facilitating the engagement of the public sector actors. So, so government ministries or agencies and getting them to share their data and to be involved in transdisciplinary research. From the funding perspective, obviously you need more research funding. You want more funding to go into transdisciplinary research. But there's also issues about how it's reviewed, the review processes need to be changed, and there's issues about how it's evaluated in, in terms of the, the outcomes uh, and the, this emphasis more on societal outcomes rather than just publications. Next slide, please. Universities are absolutely critical to this. The, they are the institutions that, that train scientists and were in most countries uh, the majority of the research takes place. Universities are also fairly traditional institutes and so there, there's, there's quite a lot that needs to happen in many universities to really promote transdisciplinary research. This includes changes to the structures and mechanisms and in particular changes to the way they evaluate people uh, during their careers. At the moment it's actually much more difficult for someone who's doing transdisciplinary research to progress through the academic career structure than it is for someone who goes into the traditional disciplinary slot. Um, the academic community can obviously um, support uh, TDR. And then the final slide, please. And then the role of intergovernmental organizations, uh, which I think is very relevant here. Um, and I would just emphasize that um, what you're already doing, I think, in, in this uh, workshop, which is building alliances and networks, forums, bringing scientists and other stakeholders together across countries and across different boundaries. OK, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Susan. Thanks so much, Kotaj. This is wonderful to uh, get that overview. And we're going to turn now to a couple of examples from different projects to see how that actually looks in, in practice um, to make that real. But just before we turn to that, I want to encourage all of you, we now have um, over 420 participants. Um, you probably all have discovered the question panel. If you have any questions to the speakers, please enter those into the question panel um, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can. We're a little bit behind, but we have probably time for a few and then answer the remaining ones uh, in writing and you will we will post that on the website. So um, in terms of um, examples of how this looks in practice, I want to first invite Isabel Sousa Pinto, um, who is a member of the multidisciplinary expert panel of IPBES, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, to talk about the lessons that um, you have learned from this panel and, and to present on what it means for knowledge generators and users to connect and engage in the kind of work um, that Cartage just laid out. Um, Isabel, give us a sense of how it's been done in IPBES.
And you might, if you are on camera, bring that on. There's a little webcam icon. You might also be muted. All right, I'm going to ask my technical advisors if you know where Isabel is or whether we should first um, go to Alice. Okay, apparently that's the clue. <laughs> We're going to first hear from Alice Vado, um, who is the principal investigator of the European Research Council funded research project called Maripol Data. Um, so, Alice, tell us what that project is about um, and, and the lessons you have learned to go from the interdisciplinary to the transdisciplinary to really engage stakeholders in the research process. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm uh, really happy to, to see this wonderful webinar with so many people that are interested in intent transdisciplinary research. So uh, my research project is funded by the European Research Council and the European Research Council funds like groundbreaking research. And one central object of the project is to develop a new multi-scale methodological approach that draws on interdisciplinary work to study science policy interrelations in practice. So we use the ongoing negotiations to develop the new BBNJ treaty to collect data. So um, my team, and we are a team of very young social science scholars, I have to mention this because it's also important to understand some of the challenges that um, we also face um, to be recognized for the interdisciplinary work that we do. So the team is composed of social scientists with different backgrounds. So we have compu computational social scientists, people with a background in international relations, law, public administration, and political science. And another dimension that is um, important to consider is that we collect different types of data, so quantitative data and qualitative data at these different scales. So the international negotiations, the scientific field where marine biodiversity data is produced, and um, on the local level where we study monitoring practices um, for studying marine biodiversity. So one central problem that we face in our day-to-day -day work is to translate these different approaches, so the quantitative perspective on science policy interrelations with the qualitative one. Um, and I will um, later on tell you what this means for, for the challenges that we encounter in interdisciplinary work. The transdisciplinary engagement is something that was not that is not very formalized in my project, and I also think that this can be an advantage. So um, when I developed the proposal that I submitted to the European Research Council, I tried to um, very early on in the development of the research design to talk to natural scientists. I interviewed them, I went to different meetings, uh, including the uh, EU Bonn meeting, Biodiversity Observation Network meeting. Um, I tried to understand how natural scientists think about their role in biodiversity politics. Then we had a project kickoff. Here I tried to identify stakeholders in Austria interested in the ocean from NGO, the ministries, uh, the parliament, intergovernmental organizations that are situated in Austria to make them aware of what we do and to also see what interest they could have in the project. And then in between, so we started two years ago, we had some small workshops where we presented preliminary results, especially from the bibliometry and the ethnography, to diplomats, to marine scientists, to experts of the law of the sea, to also get feedback in the different stages of the project. We had feedback loops also on draft articles, uh, what was especially important because we are interested in the impact of natural science, so it's important to also hear the scientists talking and the diplomats engaged in the BBNJ negotiations talking. And then we also try to reach out to the broader public by having radio broadcasts, videos, newspaper articles, blogs. So I think especially in Austria, this is a landlocked country, this ocean issue isn't very popular or very people are not that knowledgeable so it's very important also for us to reach out and in german language to communicate what we do coming now to the conditions and the challenges for this kind of work so um it's hard work uh, to do this on top of the research that we are supposed to do in the erc context 
um, with these excellence criteria. So you need regular communication and contact to the stakeholders. You need to build relations of trust to create a mutual understanding and respect. And this also includes patience, patience for how others see your work and the expectations they have. So translational work is needed also to find languages that you can use across people working with quantitative and qualitative methods, but also different stakeholders. It's important to involve different disciplines and stakeholders at different levels of the project, as I have done. I think this is extremely useful, but also to find appropriate format scopes and purposes. So what I mean by this, diplomats or um, people from NGOs, they have different rhythm, they have different needs. You have to find small formats where you can quickly exchange and not as we tend to do in academic conferences, stay there for three days. So it's a flexibility to think also about the purposes. Um, and then I think what um, we experience is there are different cultures at the local, national level, um, in different scientific and work traditions, in the policy circles, so to be uh, sensitive to these different cultures, but also to different traditions of science advice and science communication. So not expertise is not something that is considered equally relevant in different countries or at different policy scales. So we need to recognize that we may have to also be sensitive to these traditions of involving scientific work into policy making. And then obviously relationships and networks um, are differently institutionalized in different countries. Some of the challenges, and I think these relate very well to the conditions, is the availability of resources. You need time, you need personnel in order to maintain regular communication, develop the formats, keep track and build trust. But there are also different needs, and this is what my colleague um, uh, Katak Smith just said. I mean, we are supposed to publish in, in high-ranked journals, but at the same time, we would like to use our results to quickly inform those that may need it. There are different reward systems, different institutional needs. So at the university, um, and this is, I think, something that maybe Isabella Sousa Pinto will point to, as a social science scholar being involved in IPVES may not be as rewarding as a scientific publication. And um, then also maintaining interest and long-lasting relations is a, a very important point, but also to, to change the university system and to increase incentives for transdisciplinary work to be recognized by scholars. Right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alice, for those comments. And I think they really nicely capture a lot of the experience many of us have who work in this space. So um, it's good to see that it also translates across different contexts in America. This is very similar. So our technical whizzes have gotten Isabel back. So <laughs> Isabel, without further ado, um, can I just turn to you and uh, you speak a little bit about your lessons within the context of IPBES? Okay, thank you, and sorry for. Uh, uh, I tried early, too early, actually, to 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 connect, and so I, I got the wrong connection. Apparently, no anyway, uh, thank you. So what I'll what I'll do, I'll first very very quickly will uh, tell for those that don't know IPES what IPES is, because I think it's important that uh, IPES is built in a way that already brings together people with very different backgrounds. So the mission of IPES is really strengthen the knowledge foundations for better policy on science and um, on uh, biodiversity uh, and ecosystem services. is a relatively young platform, just started on 2012, but it has already 107 member uh, governments. Uh, we went through our first work program that uh, uh, that ended um, actually last year with the presentation of the global assessment on biodiversity, and uh, has a, a collaborative partnership arrangement with UNEP, UNESCO, FAO, and UNDP, and is hosted in Bonn. Next, please. So, what do, do we do next? So, we are next slide, please. We are more known, maybe, well, little known, but uh, more known for the assessing of knowledge, so the production of assessments. But uh, our functions are also for policy support, for building capacity, and for strengthening knowledge foundations. And this is very important because this is here. We try really to bring together different uh, knowledge communities, not only 
actually um, different sciences, but also knowledge communities. And we then have also um, as, a, as an objective to communicate and engage uh, different sectors of society. And of course, we have exercise to get better all the time. Uh, next, just the uh, next slide, please. This is an image of the of we published so far, and the, the by far the one that was had a bigger impact was in the uh, global assessment that was published. Uh, had really a lot of attention, also from politicians. Uh, next slide. Uh, so how are we structured? Next slide, please. So uh, this, we are a science policy uh, platform. So we have the governments um, that are really the key decision makers here and that are also responsible for deciding what kind of work we do. Uh, but within these plenaries, you also have observers. And these observers are really um, now uh, a, gr a great variety of people with different backgrounds, institutions, of course, a lot of uh, scientific institutions, but also a lot of community, uh, communities of practice. And then we have, for instance, uh, the International Indigenous Forum that really brings together uh, uh, different backgrounds. Uh, between, in between uh, um, the meetings we have, we are working full time even now with the COVID and everything. And we have a bureau that is a more political, um, organization, we have the MEP that I'm working on, um, that is really oversees the scientific and technical functions of the platform. And we have then the expert groups and task forces and the secretariat. But here in the task groups and task, uh, task forces, this is where we try really to combine the different um, uh, disciplines, different regions, different uh, 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 focus, like uh, for me, for instance, we tried. I tried to bring the marine uh, elements for in all the all the assessments and so on. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, next. <laughs> so uh, what we can do? What? How can we then bring all these aspects together in this platform? So of course, for the bureau and the map. We try to bring the different regions. This is actually what happens. We try also to balance gender, but even in the map, we try each region or some of the regions when they elect the five members, they try already to balance a bit social sciences with natural sciences, uh, also uh, people, experts on ILK and things like that. We also have uh, five task forces and those, again, we try when we select members to these task forces to do capacity building, to work in scenarios and models, uh, to do policy support tools, to uh, deal with data, we try to bring together a team of people with different backgrounds. Uh, science, again, um, from different regions and different knowledge systems. Uh, the same when we do the expert groups. So we are the ones that select the, 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 the experts are nominated by governments and other and, and, and other institutions. But we are selecting them at MEP, also the help with Bureau, and we try to put together really the best group possible um, to bring all these um, backgrounds together. And we are here, we, we are doing uh, at the moment an assessment of values. This is really crucial that we have different worldviews, different backgrounds, also the, the, the practitioners and so on. Next one. So the main challenge we are having is that when we have nominations, they are mostly still, uh, we are getting much better, I mean, we, along the years, but they're still mostly from natural science and, and I must say also terrestrial focus. So if sometimes very difficult to get marine experts. Um, also, there is a, a, a really wide gap in uh, experience from nominations from different regions and from different backgrounds. And then the uh, lack of experience methods uh, that is general, not just from IPES, really to integrate knowledge from different systems and still maintain the products with credibility for all. So some of the actions we already are 
taking is when we call for expert nominations, for instance, we really specify very much the different and really say it, the different backgrounds we would like to have. Um, and uh, we, we say we need policymakers or we need practitioners or we need on this and this, try really to uh, get the right nominations. Then we really advertise these and we are getting a wider and wider network. For instance, now we're starting with the health, uh, uh, um, human health networks, because we just got a, a workshop on biodiversity and pandemics, and this were not really very strong on, on, on contacts in this front. Um, then we have assistance from uh, not only the national focal points, but ILK task force and other task force really to spread and to really try to identify the right uh, experts. And then um, after uh, having denominations, when we look at um, the, the group we have, sometimes we don't, there are expertise that is missing. And instead of trying to really do what we can with what the nominations we have, we now have a procedure to really identify these gaps and really seek these uh, special, these specific experts that are missing and then get them nominated. And I think this is really something that is helping us a lot. Um, next. Isabel, can I ask you to just wrap up in the next minute, yeah, just so we have enough questions? Yeah, that was the last slide. Okay, good. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so thank you so much for that. That's it's actually wonderful to, see, to hear it and, and to also uh, hear your emphasis on indigenous knowledge and indigenous peoples. Um, I just want to maybe just bring that to the attention of all the people listening that there will be a specific virtual session organized under the ocean decade in January 2021 that is focused on how to bring in indigenous knowledge with all the um, unique challenges of doing that type of transdisciplinary work. So thank you for giving me that um, that opening to say that. Um, so we want to move now to a little bit of a question and answer um, period. And I want to invite um, all the panelists, Kartaj and Alice, uh, to come back. Um, and you know, let's just see, I'm getting a lot of questions in here. Um, we won't get to all of them, but there's one really interesting one that I want to um, place before you, which is, and, and you can pick maybe, Kartaj, this is, is your uh, f your suggestion first, but, but Isabel, you can answer that too, which is how will the decade transform how we work together between the global north and the global south? Are, are you making some specific efforts to, to foster that? Well, yeah, in IPES, this is uh, a focus. I mean, we really try to have a balance between the different regions, not only global north and south, but really different regions. And uh, and so this is a, a specific focus. Yeah, there are some challenges, um, as I mentioned sometimes, and that also reaching, and, and this is what I, we, we are working on, reaching really the, the right people in, in some of the regions. I don't know now, Kartaj. Um, so the work that we did, several of the case studies that we looked at were um, international north-south. Um, and generally, I would say that many of the, the southern countries are actually more predisposed to transdisciplinary research than northern countries. They don't have the same, necessarily, the same fixed academic structures and, and that are, if you like, uh, uh, less conducive to, to transdisciplinary approaches. And they also, they need solutions perhaps even more rapidly. Um, and so the, the challenges I think that maybe the decade can help overcome um, are to do obviously with, with human capacity, but also things like access to, to data and uh, the things that you need to, to do transdisciplinary research. Um, and I think in a way they, they need the authorizing environment to, to do it. Um, that 
rather than being told what they're often told at the moment that they need to compete in terms of you know academic excellence that actually equally if not more important for them is to 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 be working on solutions and using their science that way um so in some ways i i think uh, there are advantages uh already for um if you like the the lesser developed countries but um it, it goes back to one of the aims of the decade which is, is being inclusive um and you know how you do that uh, obviously respect for other cultures and those sort of things when it is north south i mean there are barriers but uh, there are many also working in that domain who who you know there's a lot of experience to build on yeah i think there are some really um strong lessons to be learned again from the isc's transformation to sustainability program which made a very distinct and and pointed effort to bring this global south into leadership roles in the research projects there's one other question i want to po post to you before we move on there's so many good questions coming in thank you everyone um we'll address some of them uh in the next segment more specifically and i already mentioned the um, focus on indigenous people coming up. So I'm going to skip that. But there is a one question about um, the absence of the physical sciences, not not mentioned in your definition, nor the more applied sciences like engineering, or I want to add the legal sciences, um, the you know uh, medicine. Um, I wonder if one of you could speak to that. Maybe again, Cartage, I start with you. But Alice, it's also a data issue. How to integrate those very different types of information so i wonder if you can both speak to how you integrate these other sciences in the decade um and in the the example that the, you are already living so so yeah so our our definition our working definition that we used was it must include natural and social sciences and stakeholders two stakeholder groups from outside so all the projects we looked uh, in principle included natural and social sciences. I think it's also fair to say, and, uh, and it came through in Alice's uh, um, project, that many of these projects come out of social sciences. For social sciences, for many social sciences, it's more natural to work in a co-production, co-design way than it necessarily is for the, for the natural sciences. And I think that's one thing that actually social sciences absolutely brings to these partnerships that natural sciences, many of them don't know how to do this, even if they want to. And so it's important that they, they work together. Um, but it's also, it's an interdisciplinary challenge anyway, getting natural and social sciences to really work together on a equal respect basis is, is a challenge as we know. Maybe Alice can, can talk about her experiences. Just a minute, Alice, in your experience. Well, um, I'd say in, in our case, it was really useful to involve lawyers at different stages. Of course, we observe the development of a new treaty. But I think an important question is, what's the purpose? What's the purpose of this kind of cooperation? And if this is to design a research project together and in the end have findings, this is much more difficult than, uh, let's say, meeting um, to uh, have an exchange of views, or in the case of IPBS, uh, where it's about having an assessment. You, these are different purposes, and I think cooperation is always good, but if you have to reach a specific goal, such as a publication or an advice for governments, then um, it may become more difficult. Great. Thank you so much, all of you, for these comments. I think they're great segues to sort of the how do we do this right in the next segment so i want to thank you all um, for participating today and we're going to now move to this next segment um, which is really about how to make it happen um, so if you want to turn your cameras off um, and then i invite uh, josh tewksbury as the first speaker to this next segment um, in which we want to focus on this question that already was alluded to on how do we build the appropriate funding structures to foster inclusive and transdisciplinary approaches. Josh is the interim executive director of Future Earth right now. Um, and um, I just you know, invite you to talk um, about the call for collaborative re research actions on ocean sustainability that um, Future Earth, Earth launched with the Belmont Forum um, and uh, JPI, the Joint Program Initiative on Oceans. 
So if you want to take that away and give us a clue of how do we do this? How do we fund it? You are on mute, Josh. <laughs> Oh, we don't have you. Okay, we need our technical whizzes. Can you unmute? Can you unmute Josh? Okay, we're not hearing you, Josh. So we're gonna try to figure this out and see if we can switch this around one more time here and actually go to, um, Schweib Luasa first and then come back to you if that's okay. So if um, Schweib, can you come on <laughs> instead? Let's see if we can get this um, global going. Yeah, uh, Suzanne, thank you. This is Schweib. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. So Schweib um, it was invited to come on to this. Uh, he is in the Department of Geography, Geoinformatics and Climatic Sciences at Makerere University in Uganda. And he's also um, the former chair of the Integrated uh, Research on Disaster Risk Science Committee, uh, an interactive discussion about um, the leading integrated research for Agenda 2030 in Africa program, LIRA 2030. Many of you um, probably have heard that acronym. So Schweib, tell us a little bit about um, the institutional barriers that um, you are you have faced in doing transdisciplinary research and let's learn from your experience and come back to the funding question. Um, thank you very much, Suzanne, and thanks everyone for the opportunity to speak on this panel. I apologize, I don't want to go into making uh, my camera work so that you could see me. I've tried and it's not working, but I will continue this way. Uh, as mentioned earlier by a couple of people, including Kathaj, the, the kind of challenges that we see, including Alice, in institutions, academic, traditional academic institutions, has a lot to do with um, um, recognition of the transdisciplinary research work and publications for promotion, but also reward system that uh, that work it tends not to be um, recognized the other challenge is that among us the peers there's also a tendency to think of the transdisciplinary research as not really scientific research and therefore you, you tend to get the feel that you getting your hands and feet dirty um for no for no for not a good uh, outcome in terms of rewards to the scientific community but at the same time we are seeing an evolution of increasing literature and, and journals uh, that are publishing transdisciplinary research. That is one side of the story, but the most important is the usable scientific research from trans transdisciplinary projects is actually getting used by the, uh, the different policy actors who usually are part of the core design and the core delivery process of our research. So with, with those two there is uh, uh, there are a couple of things that we've done to go around these kind of challenges and the most important uh, about two or three one is to identify and enable or promote champions in transdisciplinary research and these champions could be in the traditional academic institutions they could also be in practice and sometimes they are also community members who appreciate knowledge and its generation and its usability and are able to confidently talk about the process of generating that and with that you have to build partnerships and those partnerships are institutional global north global south 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 and uh, in, in as much as the funding architecture is not what we would have hoped to be right now but you alluded to the trans transition to sustainability uh, the, the Global North-South partnerships still, are still very, very, very important in terms of creating um, um, a, a, a channel through which re resources can actually get into transdisciplinary research. But uh, the other thing is also about the relationships that have to be built, nurtured and consolidated between senior researchers and junior researchers, as well as researchers and practitioners and researchers and policy actors. These are the kind of relationships and partnerships that we've worked on to try and defray the barriers of conducting transdisciplinary research back home in our institutions. 
Sorry, that's really great and interesting. Thank you so much, Schwab, for your comments. Um, stay on for the Q&A, but I want to bring back Josh. Um, and I understand, Josh, your camera and um, microphone are now working. So <laughs> do you want to tell us a little bit about how we can fund this kind of work? And everyone just stand by with us here. This is, you know, we're, we're switching back and forth um, across the continents. Um, <laughs> one of the many challenges okay. of- I believe I'm unmuted now, is that correct? Yes, you are unmuted. Go. Now, can you actually see me also? That would be, a, that's been a second challenge, but if you can see me, that's great. If not, I will just speak. Just speak, that's good. <laughs> Let's just get some audio going. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate everyone's time on this. It's a tremendous group here. And I really want to first, you know, extend, you know, of the appreciation to IOC, to UNESCO, to ISC for bringing this community together and for focusing uh, the work around the world on, you know, the 70% of the planet upon which we all depend. And I could not agree more with the sort of the emphasis that's being placed on the importance of working across disciplines, working across sectors, and working across geographies. And I, I also just want to sort of, uh, you know, say that this is hard work, and the fact that not everyone has done it is is um, is comes from our history, right? We have our, our our silos are strong, and we're working hard in this group and around the world to try and break those down to create knowledge that can effectively. Um, position itself where it needs to be so we can get through the next 20 to 30 years um, towards a more sustainable world. And I think that's what we're all focused on in this call. And that's also what Future Earth has been focused on since it was launched. And, um, you know, just a little bit on what Future Earth is. We're an umbrella initiative. We connect interlocking sustainability focused research networks across disciplines and geographies, across sectors to accelerate science that informs and supports transformations to sustainability. There is, you know, we exist across, you know, 27 different research networks, global, national, and regional networks in 30 countries. And our lane really is to connect across these sectors, disciplines, and geographies to understand the Earth system with humans as an integral part of that system. So, you know, uh, I, I want to say that, you know, that to me, that frame of what we do and what we're, what we're organizing here fits really well together. And I've been brought on here, I think, to talk explicitly about the work we've been doing, um, you know, in the, ocean, in, in the ocean areas, right? Um, so when we were started, um, Susie was a part of this process and others in our initial design team and in the um, initial science and engagement uh, committees that really pushed us forward. Um, made a, a strong emphasis in saying future earth, which comes from the global change communities, which has this 30 plus year tradition of organizing those communities across the world, needs to do more to connect across those disciplines, to break down barriers and to create structures that allow science and action to work together effectively. And, um, you know, that is what the, the, the Ocean Knowledge Action Network has been working to do for the last you know, three to four years. And I think we're now poised to make some major impacts in in that space because of the work that's gone into the development of the 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 notion the, the ocean knowledge action network which is a structure within future earth that structure is essentially led by a development team of 17 people from 14 countries crossing disciplines and sectors co-chaired from you know science and civil society um, and it's advised by experts from future earth score ioc unesco and wcrp so a fairly broad coalition and at this point, it's working to create an international program office. And there's already interested parties leaning in to say, how do we support this to become something that can have as much action as possible and collect research most, most effectively to support processes exactly like this process? Um, and that team is already working to respond to the call that's coming out you know, in, in, in mid-October. So super excited to sort of see how this can move forward. I would say that you know, the, the particular question of, well, how do you do this work? Um, I would say that what we've learned in creating knowledge action networks is that um, it's not enough to bring diverse communities into the same room, that there has to be a very strong, what I would call a strong container, a trusted uh, community that can work together across the very real, you know, you know epistemological and philosophical and uh, sort of sectoral differences that, that create the silos in the first place. And if science is going to have a larger impact, it's, it is trust relationships between people who know we need to work together that will create that impact. 
And it is not something that happens on the first meeting. It is something that is re repeated interaction between people who can understand and, and are willing to step back enough from their own perspective to hear and respond to the perspectives of people from come from very different communities who all want the same goal. So that process for us, um, I think in oceans is probably further ahead than in most other of our knowledge action networks, because you know, fundamentally, we were able to put, you know, early career resources, early career researchers in the center of that with postdocs coming in, we were able to start some really strong synthesis products with funding coming in. And now that has led to a, a sense of trust among the, the uh, development team and a broader community supporting that team, which has led to parties from around the world being interested in building that out even further and supporting work from that team. Um, I would say I, the only, yep, go ahead, stop. I'll stop can there. Can I ask you to wrap it up just so we can move on? We have two yes, more speakers. absolutely. No, that's right. Um, I would say that the only two things I would point to going forward is that, you know, part of this is a, a multi-level approach, right? It's 17 people working together. It's multiple communities working together and it's communities such as, you know, IOC, UNESCO, you know, ISC, Future Earth, Belmont Forum, working collaboratively to start research calls and to do convenings that help all of us, like the Sustainability Research and Innovation Congress that we're all starting together. I'll stop there. Great. Well, we'll come back to it and talk a little bit more about the funding structure that we need. Um, but but so st stay, stay, stay on. Um, what I want to do next is invite uh, Venka uh, Gronbeck uh, to speak to us a little bit about how we bring in the private sector. Um, um, because that is, you know, just like with ind indigenous people has its very unique challenge of, of engagement and Renke, um give us a sense of what that, you know, what that looks like, what your experience is in the context in which you're working and just give us a, a brief context um, for everyone to, to understand where you're coming from. Uh, thank you, Susan. Um, I'm very excited to be here and contribute to this session. And um, for those of you who don't know Surma Group, we are a global salmon farmer. Uh, we operate in Canada, Chile, and Norway, and we're a wholly owned subsidiary of Mitsubishi Corporation. Um, and R&D is, is certainly a priority uh, in CERMAC. Uh, we have one of the largest R&D departments in the industry, and uh, we engage with different science partners, uh, either directly or in our partnerships. And I will get back to two of those partnerships uh, a bit later on, CBOS and, and the UN Global Compact. Um, so we have a global R&D department uh, based in Norway, and it engages directly with, with uh, two national centers for research-based innovation. Um, they're called Control Aqua and Exposed. Um, and the way we're working with the centers is that you know, the aim is to perform long-term research uh, conducted in close collaboration between research performing companies on the one side and internationally recognized research groups on the other. Um, and the centers are there to enhance technology transfer, uh, internationalization and research and training. So those are pr really priorities for us. Um, and it's, it's very internationally focused. Um, in innovation products, projects that we are um, engaged in, suppliers are also critical. And um, these could be uh, vaccine suppliers, it could be technology providers um, or feed companies for that matter. Um, and topics that we engage in are right now are, uh, for example, closed containment systems, um, recirculation, aquaculture system, raw systems, uh, offshore aquaculture, just to name uh, a few things. Um, and we have very good experience, experience with these types of, of industry science collaborations. Um, we, uh, Josh mentioned trusts, and uh, I, I totally agree. Um, that's very, very important. Uh, in, in our collaborations, um, both industry science and in general, of course, establishing trust is really key. Um, and this is developed over time. Um, some other elements we see that um, we have good experience with is um, tripartite collaborations, uh, such as uh, between, so an aquaculture company, CERMAC, um, technology supplier and a scientific institution. Um, and we have a good and established network uh, in Norway. I'm using Norway now as an example. Um, and, and that's been very, very valuable to get um, innovation going, to get uh, science industry uh, projects out, out there. Um, 
And the way typically it works, um, we prioritize reissues topics um, that, you know, they're often anchored in, in uh, requirements from regulations uh, or from customer needs. And that's kind of our starting point when we start to engage um, externally in these kinds of projects. Um, the technology development innovation happens with the suppliers and then the research institutions involved uh, often provide documentation knowledge to bring the projects forward. Um, one example is um, iFarm. Uh, we just have a press release out actually this week. We just stocked the site. Um, individualized farming, uh, for those of you interested. Um, it's on YouTube, but short, uh, sweet video um, showing how um, we develop this concept and what it's about, animal welfare, sustainability uh, are keywords. And we've been working there with uh, Nofema, who contributed with scientific documentation. Um, which is really a prerequisite for innovation. Um, a second element um, that contributes to these, um, to, to good development of, of uh, these kinds of collaborations we see is, of course, um, uh, reducing financial risk uh, through co-funding, um, co-development of projects so that you know, have resources spread um, on, on different um, uh, partners. Uh, it's often um, a big investment in time and, and resources that always helps, of course. Um, and finally, uh, what we also like is to minimize the, the, the amount of bureaucracy. It can be an innovation killer, an engagement killer also. Um, so where we can focus on delivering content and practical expertise, of course, uh, that's where you want to be. Um, I'm going to briefly just mention as well how we work with um, partnerships and, and CBOS uh, is one, Seafood Business for Ocean Stewardship. Um, this, the mission statement uh, is really connecting science with key seafood industry actors to lead a global transformation towards sustainable seafood production and a healthy ocean. Um, and at its heart, it is a science business collaboration. Uh, its vision and commitments are shaped by close, long-term open dialogue between companies and a large and diverse team of scientists. Um, in this case, it's uh, anchored at in, in Stockholm University, Stockholm Research um, Center, Stockholm Resilience Center, sorry. Uh, they've done an excellent job from the beginning. And of course, CBOS is, is unique in that it was actually founded uh, based on a scientific paper that they published in 2015. Um, and I, I encourage you to have a look uh, on the website seabos.org, S-E-A-B-O-S.org, uh, where you can have a look at how this collaboration was formed and how it's working. Um, so it's a collaboration. Yes. Just I'm, to I'm, wrap up. Yeah. Yep. Just uh, Compact is the, is the last partnership I will mention. Uh, we have an excellent collaboration, of course, with UN agencies, including UNESCO IOC. Um, and uh, here we work together as, as business, science, um, NGOs, uh, community as well, uh, on developing the sustainable ocean principles um, and having uh, you know, a scientific basis for um, guidance documents that were just released this week. Uh, also the Ocean Stewardship Report, I, I would like uh, to mention in this regard. So it's, um, and we also have, by the way, a Blue Resilience Brief that addresses directly how, um, how to scale up joint science industry action. So that's just um, to wrap it up. Those are some of the engagement that we uh, see are working very well and that we're very happy to be engaged in. Um, and we are working with many of you um, in, in these uh, initiatives as well. So, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Venka. This is great, great examples, very concrete examples. I appreciate that. Um, there's one last speaker I want to bring in um, to get us a sense of what it's like to work on the policy interface. So, you know, we've had private sector, we've heard more from the funding side and from the research, um, the challenges within academia to do this kind of work. Um, so I want to invite uh, Christina Gere to, to come on and, uh, Tell us a little bit about, you are with the High Seas Policy, um, uh, you're the advisor, the High Seas Policy Advisor to the IUCN Global Marine and Polar Program. And I wonder if you can share some lessons of how to work effectively at the science policy interface, um, especially with, you know, somewhat different type of science, um, <laughs> if you will, and hopefully different type of ocean governance. So, Christina. 
Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here and to join you in this uh, vital discussion that we're having today, and I hope we'll live on for uh, the next 10 years and indeed beyond. Um, I've had the, the privilege of working um, as an advisor to IUCN since uh, 2002, if I can date myself. Um, IUCN is a unique organization. It's a membership union of 1,400 members and pulls in together 15,000 experts through various commissions. So it is fundamentally a multidisciplinary and indeed transdisciplinary organization seeking to assess problems, identify them proactively, and to work with governments and um, civil society and the sectors to find solutions. Um, does everything work beautifully? No, but um, I have been involved in sort of the areas beyond national jurisdiction. That's the 64% of the ocean that is beyond 200 nautical miles, most generally. It is very deep, distant, and of course, dynamic. Uh, so it presents its own sets of challenges. What we heard from Krista is that um, you know, science is good for diagnosing problems, but that we are still challenged at providing the solutions or motivating action. Um, we still have major knowledge gaps and weak ocean literacy, ocean awareness, especially in areas beyond national jurisdiction. One of the critical problems we're trying to address in the context of the decade of ocean science for sustainable development, but also um, through this UN agreement that's being negotiated for areas beyond national jurisdiction. It's called the um, International Instrument, Legally Binding Instrument for the Conservation, Sustainable Use of Marine Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, um, is to help build human capacity to better manage, govern, and protect and sustain our global ocean beyond national jurisdiction. So what is the current context? Well, we have many challenges. One is, as I said, the ocean is big. Um, management is fragmented. Our knowledge base is fragmented. But now the impacts are overlapping and the impacts from one sector to another or from one region to another are now cumulative. Um, we also have climate change impacts to deal with um, that are coming from the atmosphere as well as um, dust coming from the Sahara. So it's a big mix of um, problems in need of both a combination of very global ocean base and regional, national, and local solutions. Um, and yet science is still challenged. We have huge data gaps in areas beyond national jurisdiction. I've had the um, benefit of working uh, with several European Union, uh, European Commission funded projects uh, looking at deep sea and managing human impacts on the deep sea. And people are frustrated at the end of the project as you come up, well, we still need to know this, this and this. But in the context of the increasing footprint of human activities, on the deep ocean in areas beyond national jurisdiction, it is amplifying our need for better knowledge. The sectors that we deal with, the fishing, the shipping, and now seabed mining have a, often a very narrow focus just on their activity and what you need to know to manage that activity. It's not being managed to address the needs of the ecosystem or the species living as a whole. The policy challenges are, of course, as I said, the sector specific focused um, and often also limited knowledge about what the impacts are on the ecosystem, as well as limited access to the types of experts that you need. Um, and of course, there is, um, I would say, in many ways, an inherent um, bias towards maximizing the economic um, advances of this particular sector. And this can now come in our increasing increasingly limited ocean at the expense of other sectors and other interests. So what do we have now that we can um, deal with? Well, we, we do um, have a number of global processes, including the, the regular process for the um, assessment, integrated assessment of the state of the marine environment that's run out of the United Nations. That's a five-year cycle. First one finished in 2015, provided an, an baseline assessment of what's going on. This one is supposed to, the next one now, finishing in 2020, is supposed to be telling us what are the um, measures of change. 
but there's still so many gaps in that level of information. They need a much broader pool of experts to draw upon. Gizap is the um, joint group of experts on the scientific aspects of the protection of the marine environment. It's a limited number of experts working together that have realized that the need for um, cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary, and indeed transdisciplinary expertise, because one of the problems they're dealing with right now is this expanding um, transatlantic sargassum belt. And uh, for me, this um, I've been working to preserve and, and uh, protect the Sargasso Sea in the Central Atlantic, and now you have sargassum of different origins that is now a pernicious threat to many coastal states in West Africa, as well as the Caribbean and um, Mexico, um, spending millions of dollars trying to clean this stuff up. This is not a problem that anybody, any one state, any one discipline, or any one sector has a solution to. This is a beautiful, well, it's a tragic example of why we need uh, collaborative approaches to understand the source, what, how we understand the drivers, and how we actually understand some of the solutions for better dealing with this so we don't cause more harm than good. So I will just close. I see Susan there. Um, is for the areas beyond national jurisdiction, what we're really looking at is a move towards regional environmental assessments, integrated assessments that can pull on all stakeholders, all sectors, um, looking at a ocean basin level as well as sub basin level, trying to identify what knowledge do we need for better managing our shared resources and shared values in areas beyond national jurisdiction. I would encourage people to look more at the Global Environment Facilities Large Marine Ecosystem Projects for how we can glean some lessons learned, one on funding these very important programs, but also how do we build on what they have done to make this an ongoing process, because the science answers are never going to be enough to address the solutions we need for the following year and the following decade. So I'll close there. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Christina. This is great. And I just want to um, also state that you're uh, part of the executive planning group for this decade. So that's, you know, you can see what enormous expertise we have available to guide this decade and, and the revolution, as we said in the beginning. So thank you, Christina. I have one more speaker for you, which um, I think is going to be re a really interesting case. Uh, ben Bottler, if you want to come on, he is with the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies. Um, in Germany and a co-lead of the Strong High Seas Project, which is, um, you know, a, a project that, uh, a, a transdisciplinary scientific research uh, project that tries to cr create a cross-sectoral platform um, for stakeholders um, in the project's target regions, which is the Southeast Atlantic and the Southeast Pacific. Um, and, you know, this is an, a really interesting uh, biological region, if you will, uh, or from a point of a point of uh, productivity, a really interesting region uh, where lots of people want to grab all the resources in that region, which brings up lots of tra uh, trade offs and, and conflicts, I'm sure. I wonder if you can speak a little bit to how we can, you know, both strengthen the governance side, but also the, the role of scientists in shaping ocean governance in these highly contested or potentially conflictual uh, contexts, which is, you know, it's not a comfortable place for most scientists to be in. <laughs> yeah, okay. I hope you can hear me. Um, thanks, Susan, and uh, many thanks uh, for the invitation uh, to participate uh, in, the, in the workshop today. Uh, much appreciated. Um, yeah, so as mentioned, I'm one of the coordinators of the, the Strong High Seas Project, which is um, funded by the German government through the International Climate Initiative. And um, first, I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about the perspective and the approach that uh, we take as a project. Um, and that is that the regional level can and should play a significant role in advancing the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction uh, by contributing to improved global governance of the ocean. Uh, and that successful cross-sectoral cooperation in conserving biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction requires a, a common goal or purpose and overarching set of principles 
uh, as well as an appropriate distribution of competence between the global and regional levels of, of governance. And we also take the approach that the regional level can underpin global standards in a future uh, BB&J agreement. Uh, so as, as Christina mentioned, currently being negotiated in the UN, uh, but also by developing, implementing and enforcing regionally or sectorally based agreements. And that this perspective therefore also allows for specifics of a region to be taken into account. So its challenges and needs, uh, as well as potentially to go beyond the, sta the, the standards um, established in such processes. And so what we're, what we're finding in the Strong High Seas Project is that there's really a, a really huge need to bring together knowledge generators and, and knowledge users um, through different mechanisms. So workshops, joint scientific assessments, or, or shared information platforms. But really that this idea that uh, there's those that create knowledge and then there's those that uh, use knowledge um, uh, is, is really becoming kind of an outdated way to conduct research, or, or at least um, in, a, in a project um, such as ours. And that's to say, of course, that knowledge is, is a two-way street, that there's scientists, decision makers, decision makers, scientists, and of course, all other relevant um, stakeholders. Um, but when considering the high seas, um, as, as mentioned, um, um, it's, it's, it's a rather under-researched area compared to other marine areas. And a, and a lot of knowledge, expertise, and data can be, can be scattered across research institutes, um, government ministries, or, or NGOs, for example. And this is really true, of course, at all levels of governance from, from local to global. And so by bringing people to the room and engaging them in a discussion on biodiversity and high seas, so such a project like um, Strong High Seas really offers the, this regional level and regional stakeholders the opportunity to learn from one another, but also to boost their capacity um, and their trust in one another and their trust in us to potentially make joint decisions about a shared region of common interest or how, it, how they might go about tackling and implementing global goals. And at least the feedback that we're getting um, uh, so far from the from the from our two focus regions is that the project is really filling an important gap um, that at least till now was there so of course it also begs the question as how, how such a gap will continually um, continue to be fulfilled filled excuse me um, in the long term or when the when the project uh, comes to an end um, and last uh, coming you know a bit more to your question I think it's it's important to know or important to make the point that this project um, from its very conceptualization was, was discussed and developed with regional stakeholders. So specifically um, regional organizations and their member states, but also scientific organizations, inter international organizations. Um, and this was done to ensure that the objectives and design of the project were there to, to meet a true and recognized request um, from those um, that the project would eventually be working with. So it's not designed in, in isolation or, or independently from, from the stakeholders or the areas it was meant to support. And we're now a little over halfway through the project, about two and a half years. And, and we still continue to strive to ensure that all of the project activities, scientific assessments, technical workshops, capacity building events, that these remain co-designed and co-developed with, with both regions. And, you know, we do this by continually engaging with stakeholders, trying not to burden them too much, of course, but to continually identify what their current and expected needs are. And for us, it's ensuring that the project operates um, as a continuous discussion. Because we realize, of course, that priorities or, or political situations when, when doing such research, and especially when working with states, um, can change very quickly and rapidly. And, and this is especially the case right now with the, the current pandemic. Um, so such an approach can become burdensome, time consuming, but it's really um, the only way we have to ensure that its outputs remain relevant and useful. Um, and, and we're very thankful that our work program and our parameters um, allow us to be flexible um, throughout such a, such, the, such a project duration. Um, in this sense, we've also really found that it's important to uh, sit down as a project with stakeholders, with advisory board and, and go through a, a reassessment process um, and try to adapt uh, our work program and, and what we are trying to achieve with those uh, that we're working with. I'll leave it there. Thanks. Great.
Thank you so much, Ben. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry we're running a little short on time here, um, but I, I want you to stay on and bring everybody else from this panel on for just a couple of last questions. And um, Schweib, if you are still on, I want to pose the first question back to you. And that is one that's come through in a couple of questions that we received um, and, and also something that um, Josh mentioned, which is the issue of supporting early career researchers in this type of work. Um, I wonder if, you know, I mean, for so many early career researchers, the pressure, at least in academia, is essentially to publish, publish, publish to get your job, right? And, and what we heard in all of these approaches is it takes time to build a trust, it takes time to build the relationships. Um, it's quite contrary to sort of the typical guidance early career researchers get um, and to stay in their disciplinary lanes on top of that. So I'm wondering, um, Schwab, if you can speak a little bit about, you know, what have you learned through the Lyra project or, um, you know, other work that you've done of how to support particularly the young ones coming into this world doing this kind of work? Thank you very much, Suzanne. Uh, again, from Lira Project, because we've worked with multiple earlier career researchers from uh, different countries across Africa, different languages across Africa. And some of the things that come through as big lessons for us is that as senior researchers, to support the early career researchers, you need to uh, provide the leadership to produce demonstrable outputs and outcomes. And that is in terms of publications and any other materials of usable science that continuously can engage them in the science, but also in the practice. And that way, uh, some of them have gotten motivated to continue in that line. And, and of course, that would depend on how you identify the early career researchers that are good and can stay working on this kind of project. So identifying promising early career research is important and they need motivation. So we continue to give them motivation. How do we do that? Co-authorship is one aspect of it. Um, bridging their networks and expand, enabling them to expand their networks in the academy, but also outside the academy in the practice and community engagement uh, is something that is very motivational. I have so many examples, I won't mention the names and specific ones where um, some of the early career researchers almost like go off in the communities and they work with policymakers all the time and only less time at the university. So that lifts them up. And initially in terms of for, for the senior researchers, they will be a heavy lift, uh, but usually the good ones will always pick a lift from that and uh, advance that. The other thing that we've also done is also to give them responsibility. Depending on the stage where they are in terms of their research career, you have to gauge their abilities and be able to give them responsibility. So the LIRA product, uh, project program has actually um, uh, given them responsibility to lead on their projects, to lead on their publications, to lead on the engagement with the practice and policy makers. And, and that is very motivational. I found that very motivational for them because they see value in, in what in the transdisciplinary research they are doing, but they also feel appreciated by the multiple stakeholders that they work with, and that simply just kicks, um, keeps them into the drive to do uh, to do more research. We've had quite interesting examples where, um, um, in, in the process, you 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 as a senior researcher, you delegate, if you will, the responsibility to lead on academic paper the responsibility to lead in research project. And just yesterday, Urban, the Journal of Urban Geography just accepted one of uh, the papers by my early career researcher. And she, he was, he's still celebrating. He, he doesn't believe that he's managed to do it. But like you mentioned, it takes to, to the And then that's part of the, um, the, the, the patience, if you will, that uh, senior researchers would have to, 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 to have and uh, be able to lead and, and, and um, enable these early career researchers to advance in their studies. Yeah. Great. Those are the things that we have done, Suzanne. Yeah, wonderful. I, I want to bring one last question and then unfortunately we have to uh, wrap it up um, for today because we want to have a little bit more time for next steps for all of you. But one question that's come up in various ways and you all hinted at that is you know, there's on the one hand, huge data gaps. And on the other hand, you're dealing with private sector data, which are often proprietary and difficult to access. And certainly 
um, you know, challenges around sharing. And then there's indigenous peoples whose knowledge is considered sacred and not up for sale and not up for exploitation one more time. And I wonder if you can share, you know, just really briefly some lessons of what are the best practices of how to handle that? What have you learned? And, and there might, Monka, you might start with that um, from the private sector. Uh, yeah, thank you, Susan. That's a very, very, very important question. And we, you know, transparency is something that we're working on uh, both as a company and as we're also pushing in our partnerships. Um, I believe the seafood industry has become uh, much more transparent, uh, at least on the aquaculture side, uh, the past few years. And we have industry, um, joint industry reports, actually, and reporting through the Global SAM Initiative as one example. Um, reporting on a number of sustainability and, and uh, animal uh, welfare issues. Um, so, so that's one example, but it's of course a, a big challenge. Uh, when it comes to the indigenous um, uh, relations part, um, we work very closely um, on the ground where we have operations uh, in Canada, for example, we have a very good relations with, with many First Nations um, and we established our, our um, way we're working through um, a set of uh, principles actually uh, that are anchored in UNDRIP and, and other uh, other uh, important global sources. So it's, um, yeah, local community engagement, certainly very important. Um, our own transparency is important and also um, pushing the bar um, in the industry as a whole. Great. Josh, um, just one closing word on that. Um, I see you. No, that's great. I mean, I, I just wanted to return just briefly to the, the ECOPS issue and the importance of the next generation ECOPS. of leaders. ECOPS is what? Oh, sorry. It's Thank just... you. Um, no, that's fantastic. <laughs> the, the early career um, research, early career professionals and, you know, the, the whole program that the IOC has developed, you know, on this area and the global motivation to, to include the next generation of ocean science leaders in this process started with two postdocs that were given the freedom to lean in on this process both through the Future Earth process and others, Alfredo and Aaron, pushed this with a whole group to make this now a global priority. And that won't happen unless we come up with funding structures to allow those early career researchers the freedom to engage in processes like this. And I think that's doable, but it's a motivating factor for funders around the world to broaden the lens so that we can have a broader conversation starting with those next generation leaders. Great. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. And I'm really sorry we have to interrupt this because this is just the beginning of the conversation. And maybe that's the best way to both thank you all for participating in this, but also to you know remind everyone that we have received so many questions. We're going to post some of those to our panelists, the previous one and to this one, and hopefully get those answers posted on the website for the session. Um, as soon as we can. I think, you know, there's just so many good things that you can all speak to. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, and I want to just maybe um, before we go to next steps, just, you know, elevate a couple of points um, that that I heard, at least in the session, um, which is, you know, there are so many different ways and platforms and forums and with so many different partners that we can collaborate. And, and there is much still to learn of how to do that, but we also don't need to entirely reinvent that. You know, we have now several decades of experience in that. And those of you who are entering into this and you have not yet done this kind of work, um, there is lots of literature. Um, it's a little fragmented, but, you know, we're actually beginning to, to learn both what transformation is about, what um, interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity is about. So. Hopefully we can jump in at a fairly high level into this revolution that you all are part of and are shaping. Um, and, and also really this, this theme of strengthening regional coordination and collaboration um, across the seas, across the world, north and south, I think really important. Um, we heard a lot about the challenges and the difficulties of doing this work. And I really look forward in the both the regional sections, um, sessions that we have, but also once we sort of move through this decade to do stock taking as we go and to actually share lessons, not just, you know, here's all what's wrong and here's all what's problematic and what we don't have, but here's how we actually make a difference. Um, and that requires really strong strategic uh, focus. And, you know, the last thing that I just want to say, and, and as a, a form of appreciation that you all are trusting us to, to uh, be part of this process and have put yourself into it, 
the importance of trust. I mean, that is that that's the very foundation for the work that we do. And you can't rush that. And I think in high pressured situations like we're in right now, um, and with you know accelerating global changes, I think that is that's going to be a crunch <laughs> that we simply have to work through. I think the investment in trust and the time built into relationship is worth every ounce of it. So thank you all for that. And I want to turn it now to Alison Clausen, um, who is with the IOC, and he will talk to us a little bit about where we take this next and where do we go next. So if the rest of you want to turn off your cameras. Thank you so much. And Alison, take it away and close us out. Thank you very much, Susie. And I also feel a little bit guilty for interrupting such a fantastic discussion. There's obviously a lot more that we that we could talk about. And uh, luckily, we'll have that opportunity in the regional sessions and, and moving forward. But I want to get very practical now um, and particularly talk to you about the call for decade actions that is coming up. Now, as many of you will know, the implementation plan envisages that over the life of the decade, diverse groups are going to come together, transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, co-design, collaborative research, and put together potential decade actions in the forms of programs or projects or activities or contributions that will contribute to the ocean decade challenges and thus fulfill the decade vision. So to identify these actions, because it's an entirely bottom-up process, there's nothing that's already defined in terms of what these actions are going to look like, there will be calls for decade actions regularly throughout the decade. And through those calls, interested parties can submit their ideas, their transformative initiatives, proposals, and have those endorsed as formal decade actions that are contributing to this collective effort. So the first of these calls will start in a few weeks. We're very busy preparing all the all the, the pieces of that now. This first call, and I really want to insist on the fact that it is only the first of a series, is going to focus on two types of actions, of, of potential decade actions. So the first type is global or major regional programs of work. And the second type is in-kind or financial contributions to the decade, including contributions to the coordination functions of the, of the decade. Now, this call is going to open on the 15th of October, so in about three weeks' time now, um, and it will be open until the 15th of January to allow people time to, to, to come together and, and, and put ideas together. It's going to be a fairly simple um, online system where people will need to fill in alignment with the decade vision, alignment with the challenges and the outcomes, and then really explain how they meet the, the different endorsement criteria uh, that are contained in the implementation plan. Decisions on the call will be made in the first quarter of 2021, once the, the governance and coordination structures are in place. And a few other things are trying to anticipate some of the questions, but a, a few other things that I think it's important to say is that for this first call, at least, there are no geographic or thematic restrictions, as long as it fits into one of those two categories and, and contributes to one or more of the ocean decade challenges. There are no limits on who can apply. It can be new or existing initiatives or parts of existing initiatives that meet the, meet the endorsement criteria. The programs that are being submitted don't need to have all the funding secured before they're submitted. I think we need to be very clear, this isn't a funding call. It's, it's really a, a call for ideas to be endorsed under the decade. But you can submit something that doesn't yet have all the, all the funding secured. We very much welcome programs that will contribute to post-COVID recovery, including ways in which we can shore up the sustainability of ocean science, whether that be infrastructure, people, institutions, um, processes, et cetera, in a post-COVID world, because we all understand in our work of every day how COVID has affected the sustainability of ocean science. We really encourage groups to work together to develop collaborative and ambitious programs. And we will play a role uh, helping to connect groups who, who may want to, to be put in touch with others working on similar issues. And there'll be a, a way to do that through the website. And finally, just to repeat, if you're not ready for this call right now in October, um, or if you're interested in, in submitting different levels of decade action, so maybe not a major program, but something at a project level or at a national level, there will be many other calls through the uh, calls for action throughout the decade. So don't feel like this is the only opportunity that, that you will have. There will certainly be other, other calls. So to learn more about the call, please do keep an eye on the, on the website. We're going to put all the documentation there. Um, the implementation plan is already up there with the summary. So if you're not familiar with that document, that's a really good place to start. And there's an option on the website to actually sign up. Um, if you do that, you'll receive direct email updates as we, as we start preparing for the call. 
And then to answer all the questions that I'm sure we're not going to be able to get to today, we're planning two live question and answer sessions specifically on the on the topic of the call for decade actions. Um, and they'll be with IOC staff, either on Facebook or Instagram or another platform. One will be in mid-October, um, probably around the 20th, and one around the 6th of November. But dates and details of those will also be put on the, um, on the website. And if we can jump quickly to the next slide, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes very quickly to run over some of the other next steps and key milestones that are coming up over the next 12 months. Um, it's going to be a very, very busy 12 months for, for us and, and all our partners. So the implementation plan is currently with the 75th session of the United Nations General Assembly. And that's something that's going to be considered over the next few months to, to get the, the advice and the recommendations of the UN member states on the implementation plan and have a, have a final version of that. Um, early December, we hope to have a high level virtual supporters event. And we would like to, we'd love to see a lot of you um, listening into that. That's where we hope to have some of our, our very high level government, uh, philanthropic, private sector supporters coming out and explaining why the decade is so important to them. Um, having a pre-launch of the Ocean Decade Alliance, which is a resource mobilization mechanism and talking about some of the, the, the next steps for the, in the lead up to the launch of the decade, which is obviously on the 1st of January, as is noted there. January to July next year, then is really a time we'll be, where we'll be getting the different um, operational mechanisms live. So some of the stakeholder engagement mechanisms, the governance and coordination structures, and, and giving people different ways of, of interacting with the, with the global stakeholder forum, which will be a mixed virtual and in-person forum. Um, as I mentioned, March to April, we'll have the decisions on the first set of endorsed decade programs and contributions that come through this this call which is coming up in a in a in a few weeks and then in late may and then sometime probably in mid 2021 we're not sure two major international events uh the first international ocean decade conference in berlin which the german government has very kindly offered to host and of course the un ocean conference in lisbon that we unfortunately don't yet have dates for but we think will possibly be sometime around mid to uh, beginning of the third quarter of of 2021 there'll be many many other events as well, um, regional events, local events, celebrating the launch of the decade and, and, and working on the development of regional action plans and regional initiatives. So the best thing to do is really to, to again, sign up to the website to get information as it as it comes out and then, and then keep an eye on the different stakeholder engagement mechanisms as they are rolled out early next year. And I think I'll leave it there. Um, thank you very much. And I'll pass back to Susie. Thank you so much, Alison. I really appreciate it. And I love that there is just such a simple URL. Ocean Decade, you can all remember that, <laughs> right? And so I wanna, in closing, simply thank you all for participating. We will post the uh, um, slides from this uh, uh, session and the answers to the questions that we didn't get to on the website, on that oceandecade.org website, and all the announcement that Allison just mentioned will all be there. So I invite you to really be part of this, um, stay engaged in this, um, and, and be part of the revolution. <laughs> so with that, um, also just to mention that, you know, again, we will have these regional sessions um, that start in October um, that will particularly focus on regional priorities and, um, for co-design science, but also on capacity needs. Um, and the, the link to register for those sessions will be very shortly um, posted on the Decade website. So again, oceandecade.org, um, be part of it. And thank you so much for being part of this opening session. With that, I will close us out and let us all go to do whatever we have. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>